Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, first of all, I have to apologize that I know some people showed up for the Monday and Wednesday classes that uh, didn't happen. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, it says in the syllabus, and I think I also mentioned it in class quite a few times. Um, but um, anyway, I'm sorry that wasn't clearer. Uh, and uh, I'll say, I guess I'll send out an email before Monday to remind people that there's one more class that will be canceled. Um, and um, yeah, also to let you know, I think Wednesday will be in person, but uh, not 100% sure, but I'll let you know. Okay. Um, so where we are in the book. Um, As usual, we're inside the doctrine of elements. The doctrine of elements has two parts, transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. And the transcendental logic has two parts, transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic. And transcendental analytic has two parts. Analytic of concepts and analytic of principles. So we've almost finished the analytic of concepts. Analytic of concepts has two parts. The part um, people call the metaphysical deduction, and I think in today's reading was the place where Kant calls it the metaphysical dimension, and transcendental deduction. And this is part two of the transcendental deduction. So even though the transcendental deduction isn't uh, divided into two parts in the table of contents. Um, it's it does seem to it does seem to have two parts to it. Um, the first part goes through section twenty. I guess section twenty one is a kind of transition, and then but but the second part is twenty one through twenty six. Um, and what I've been saying is that whereas the metaphysical deduction shows that um, if we have experience, that is empirical knowledge of objects, then um, our experience must conform to the categories. Um, whereas the transcendental deduction is supposed to show that um, we do have experience. <laughs> um, that is that we do have empirical knowledge of objects. Um, and um, uh, last week I was trying to explain how the the first part of it works. So I think, I mean, as I said, the the first part, is goes on in abstraction from what our form of sensible intuition is. Um, so even though we don't know any other example of a possible form of sensible intuition, we know ours is specific. And I, I tried to explain how we know that or what that means. Um, so um so we can consider the case of a discursive intellect that is of an intellect or understanding that um uh that 
is not intuitive and so it requires a sensible intuition in order to refer to an object, we can consider that without taking into account what our form of sensible intuition actually is. And that's the first part of the transcendental deduction. And then the second part of the transcendental deduction brings in uh, time and space, but especially time. Um, uh, and then um, somehow, uh, um, well, the way I explained it was that the first part shows that when we think of a discursive intellect, we're, we're thinking of something whose object conforms to the categories. So we're thinking of something that has experience of an object, but we don't know if that thought, but that thought by itself could be empty. Right? That is um, because it doesn't involve any intuition and the the second part of the transcendental deduction is by by bringing in the case that we know to be actual of ourselves with our form of intuition um shows that uh that there actually can be such a thing as discursive intellect right that is in other words we only know that that such a thing is possible because we are one so we only know that it's possible at all from considering our actual case. Um, um, now, as far as how that first part works, first of all, are there questions about that so far? I know there's only three people here, but all three of you are people who might ask questions. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Okay, so um, the, so the second part is like it's basically like an application of the first part, but it's a special kind of application because it's only through the application that it's shown that there's anything to apply, basically. Um, that's what's unusual here. Right? That is like normally, once you know the principle, the application is uh, to specific cases that fall under the principle is kind of trivial. But in this case, uh, the, um, the application is what shows that they were actually thinking anything in the principle. <laughs> So that's why it's a whole separate part of the deduction. And until we've done it, the deduction isn't complete. Okay. And so like, I'm not going to go through all the steps I was saying at the end last time uh, in, in detail, how the first part works. Um, uh, but remember I said it was based on um, The, the the key move, as I understand it, is you know uh, that um, I can't deny that I'm a discursive intellect. Which another way of putting this is, I think, or ego cogito. Right? So that's the transcendental ego or the I think that must be must be possible for it to accompany all my representations and so forth, right? That's I think is the same as saying I'm a discursive intellect. Um and then, you know, like the uh I mean, I wish because it's not easy. <laughs> I wish I had time to try to fit this in detail to what Kant actually says, um, uh, you know, like sentence by sentence. Um, and because it's not easy, which 
possibly means I'm completely wrong. <laughs> um, but, um, but instead, I'm just, again, going to say, like, briefly, like, an overview of this is that thinking, you know, um, means uh, using universal representations, representations that could possibly apply to different cases. And um, using a representation that could possibly apply to different cases means representing myself as possibly being the same subject in another case. Right? So that's, that's the way the requirement for an object comes in here. And the object is myself. Right? That is, I have to be able to somehow represent myself as the same um, subject of this universal representation, despite the fact that um, some other intuition is being used with it. And again, in this first part, since uh, we're abstracting from the form of our sensible intuition, we can't say more about it than that. Right? That is... We can't say something like, at another time, I'll be the same subject using this representation with a different intuition, because that's bringing in time, which is the which is our specific form of inner sense. But um, and by the way, whether the distinction between inner and outer applies to any discursive intellect. I, f I mean, I feel like it. It does, at least insofar as we conceive of an of of a discursive intellect, because as we'll see in the amphiboly of the pure concepts of reflection, the pair of concepts inner and outer, um, it's uh, corresponds to the category of relation, um, and the, those those pure concepts of reflection seem to be have the same status as the categories. Basically, they're like another way that the functions of the understanding and judgment come out. Um, so it seems like that's not a connected to our form of intuition specifically. However, we don't know what inner and outer would mean if we had a different form of intuition. Um, for us, somehow, uh, but this is something I feel I don't understand very well. But for us, somehow spatial inner and outer are are related to the difference between inner and outer sense. Really, like I mean, like I'm inside my body, and external things are out of it. <laughs> um, but. Um, well, I'll say more about that as as much as I can, which is not much when we get to the amphiboly. But so for now, I'm just like we at least have an inner sense and outer sense. Kant doesn't really ever explain explicitly why that is. But we do have an inner sense and an outer sense, and time is the form of inner sense. So um, um um, so if we didn't abstract from that, we would be saying, I have to represent myself as the same subject at different times. And that basically is, is what he's going to say in the second part of the transcendental deduction when he brings in our specific form of sensible intuition. But in the first part, again, it's just like, I must be the same subject of this universal representation in different cases. Um, and that is what I said Kant means by the synthetic unity of apperception. The, the, synthet the analytic unity of apperception is just saying this representation is the same in different cases. The synthetic unity of apperception is saying the subject of the representation is the same in different cases. 
So the subject of the representation is uh, itself an object of representation, where it is I regard myself as the same in different cases. And for, for me to be able to do that, it must be possible to, um, so somehow, again, at this, at this stage, we don't know how, but somehow there's manifoldness in sensible intuition. It requires to be, there's something that requires to be unified. Um, and um, that I'm able to represent myself as always the same subject means that it must be possible somehow to collect or put together that manifoldness in such a way that it can be unified by a rule. So that putting together is synthesis, right? Synthesis just means putting together. As I said last time, again, it's not the same as synthetic judgment, although it's, I mean, it's the same word synthetic <laughs> and it's, it's related to the possibility of synthetic judgment. Um, but when we say synthesis, we're talking about um, what it is that somehow puts together manifold what's manifold in intuition in such a way that it can be compared to a single rule. Um, and then uh, if you ask, well, okay, uh, um, what does it take for the manifoldness given in intuition to be comparable to a single rule, that is to an empirical concept? And the answer to that is, well, um, all we can say about it in general is that every empirical concept involves applying the categories. So what we've shown is that the categories are, are guaranteed to have a possible object. Um, they're guaranteed to have a possible object based on this premise, which I can't deny that I think. Um, now there's one thing that's a little confusing, I guess, yeah, I should go on to go into this before, yeah. Yeah, maybe I should at least just mention it. So section 19 of the Transcendental Deduction um, brings in the forms of judgment again. Um, and it's and there Kant says something about judgments that he didn't exactly say before. Um So, I mean, the reason the forms of judgment are coming in is because, like, before section 19, Kant has just shown that uh, um, there must be an object of experience, namely myself. Right? That is, um, and I think... I think there's no demonstration that there's any other object of experience besides myself until what's called the refutation of idealism, which is towards the end of the, the analytic of principles. So, uh, so like up until that point, we're still in kind of Descartes world, right? We're like the only thing that is, I mean, uh, 
Descartes' second meditation world, where the only thing I've shown to exist is myself. And um, um, even though Kant brings many examples from other things we know about, like lines and boats and water that freezes and becomes ice and whatever, um, the, uh, um, we haven't shown that there is any such thing as water and boats and ice or uh, that is we haven't we haven't shown that there's an object of external sense until we get to the refutation of idealism. So, um, right, so there's an object of experience, you know, means there's an object given an inner sense. Um, and uh, there's an object given an inner sense means some concept applies to the contents of inner sense. And we don't know what it is, but it's uh, it's it's a rule to which what's manifold in inner sense conforms. Um, and the reason the forms of judgment come in is as a transition to saying uh, what I what I just said before, namely, whatever that rule is, it has to involve the application of the categories, right? So remember, the categories are derived from the forms of judgment or the um, functions of the understanding in judgment. So that's why section 19 begins with a little thing about what a judgment is. Um, and he says that the copula, right? So in a categorical judgment, now, I mean, he starts off by, by criticizing the logicians. He says, logicians just want to define a judgment as the relationship between two concepts. Um, uh, if you're in 100C, like as part of the reading for today, Locke defined a proposition as a relation between two ideas. Right, that's that's Locke's version of the same thing, and Kant criticizes it first of all because he says, "Look, this only applies to categorical judgments." And but then he says, anyway, leaving that aside, they don't say what the nature of this relationship is. Now and then he goes on to discuss it himself as if all judgments were categorical judgments. <laughs> Right, that is, he because he says what the copula. This is the copula is. Um, he says what how how the different representations are joined by the copula, and apparently here the these the different representations really are the subject concept and the predicate concept. I'm not completely sure about that actually. Remember, I said that when he, that that earlier when he talks about the way a judgment unites representations, he means basically that it unites all the manifold intuition that conforms to the subject concept. He unites it in such a way that the predicate concept can be applied to all of it. Um, but here, it, I guess he's talking about how the subject and the predicate are joined. And But again, he himself pointed out that that's not really sufficient to, to talk about judgments in general. I mean, not only does it only apply to categorical judgments, it really only applies to universal affirmative judgments, what he says here. Right? Because he's, he's talking, because what he says is, that the copula joins the, these representations in the object. So the, the object is this direction, so to speak. <laughs> right? The, the judgment singles out an object and then applies the by the subject and then applies the predicate to it. So the object of the judgment is the object of the subject concept. Um, and he says that the copula and the judgment means that these representations are joined in the object. Well, I mean, 
that we understand, at least assuming this is a synthetic judgment, not an analytic judgment. Right? So we and like the example he gives, an example we've seen before, all bodies are heavy. When we say when we judge that all bodies are heavy, we mean that um, somehow in the whole object of experience, that's a body is also a principle from which heaviness follows. Um, And here he contrasts it with the mere association of the representations by the imagination or like, um, um, that what we're doing when we say, say all bodies are heavy is saying that these things go together because of a principle in the object. Now, I mean, of course, we could be wrong about that. That's, I mean, we make judgments that are wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, and essentially, this is why we can make judgments that are wrong, right? If we weren't claiming something about the object, but only we're claiming something about what we associate with what, then we couldn't be wrong. Um. So... Uh, right. So, so that's what he's saying about the function of the copula. But again, it like it needs a lot more needs to be said. Right. If, like even if this is a particular judgment rather than a universal judgment, then already we're not saying just that. Right. If we said some bodies are heavy, we wouldn't be saying that there's a principle in the object of the concept body from which heaviness follows because that means that would mean all bodies are heavy so um So, right, so like that, this discussion of the nature of judgment is kind of unsatisfactory. Um, but, um, but I think like, again, you can understand why judgment comes in here and, and, and why he wants to make the point that like somehow or other, the unity that judgment um, uh, represents as a unity in the object that that's what judgment is for um um because the um Because he, he wants to show that in order to represent myself as an object, um, the, the way I have of rep my, re representing myself as an object are the same as the functions of the understanding and judgment. And therefore, they're the same as the categories. Um, So, I mean, I sort of understand that and I sort of don't. I feel like, again, this is the same thing I didn't really understand in the metaphysical deduction. 
why it's better to start with the forms of judgment. Why, why not just say to the represent myself as an object, I must represent myself through a concept. And the categories are the capacity are the parts of our capacity to form empirical concepts. So the categories must apply to the manifold in inner sense. Um, uh, but instead, it's like um, there's something about judgment that's supposed to be more obvious than that. And then we go from the forms of judgment to the categories. Um, um, I know that some people make a big deal about Kant giving the priority to judgment. Uh, Carl, you know, we've been seeing that in Bob Brandom <laughs> uh, and connecting that with the thing that Frege says about priority of judgment, which like a lot of things in Frege, I'm not inclined to take that seriously, but uh, a lot of people are and maybe they're right. Anyway, uh, so, you know, uh, that's maybe just a name for the thing I don't understand here. <laughs> um, in any case, that's all I have to say about the first part, how I think it works. Now I'm going to go on to discuss the second part. Again, unless there are questions. Okay, so actually, I'm going to start with... One second. I'm going to start with Descartes. Um, so, um, Here's the way the cogito argument actually um, appears in the second meditation. And okay, I, I so I shouldn't assume everyone even knows what the cogito argument is, right? The cogito in Latin means I think. So we're talking about the fame Descartes' famous argument, I think, therefore I am. But uh, although those words, I think, therefore, I am, occur in the discourse and possibly also in the principles, they don't actually occur in the second meditation, which is the kind of official place of that argument. And instead, this is what, what happens. Um, let me start up here. Right, so this is after Descartes or Descartes' character, the meditator has just finished casting doubt on everything. And then has said, well, don't I at least exist? Um, answer, but I have convinced myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world, no sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies, right? That is no object of inner sense and no object of outer sense. Does it now follow? So in other words, we're at a point where um, we're doubting and therefore abstracting from the presence of any object, I think is one way of, or any object of our actual senses in any case. Does it now follow that I too do not exist? And the answer, so this, this answer is, is the place the argument actually happens. No, if I convince myself of something, then I certainly existed.
right? So, um, I convinced myself is the, of course, is is the meditators doubt, right? Like I, I, of course. Um, I didn't prove that there is no there are is no sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Um, but I convinced myself that uh, that I don't know whether there is. So, uh, like, I should deny it until I I find some basis for it. And that's enough to show my existence that I had that thought. So, um, so I think as far as Kant goes, like you can say, well, so far so good, right? That is, Kant agrees with Descartes up to this point. Um, so, um, if you look on B157, it's a note to B157, and that's on page 169 in Kemp Smith. And it starts, um, the I think expresses the act of determining my existence. What determining means here exactly? I'm not sure. And if I have time at the end, I'm going to say a little bit about how little I know what determining means in this context. But anyway, the I think expresses the act of determining my existence. Existence is already given thereby. Right? So just the I think, that is, I am a discursive intellect, um, which I think at least I was saying that for Kant, as for Descartes, like the basis of that is that I'm engaged in this argument. Um, um, like somehow that activity is what Kant is calling determining. The 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 one that in Descartes is this at least a special case of it in Descartes is convincing or persuading myself um actually says persuading i'm not sure why they decide to translate it as convincing but in any case um so uh but so what's the problem well i mean descartes himself says what the problem is um so this is uh, like the next paragraph, but I do not yet have a sufficient understanding of this, what this I is that now necessarily exists, or you could also translate as that I necessarily am. That's what it says. I do not yet have sufficient understanding of what this I is or I mean that he uses actually there's a first person verb there too, but I think you can't do that in English. What this I am that that I that that I now necessarily am <laughs> is basically what it says. Um so um that is the this I think has proved that I exist. Um but um, it hasn't yet shown me what I am, <laughs> which is weird, <laughs> right? In 100B, I always stop at this point and point out how weird that is. How could I have shown something exists without knowing what it was I was showing? <laughs> Um, so, like, uh, Descartes, I think, doesn't really have an explanation for that, whereas Kant does have an explanation, and he agrees 
that a problem has been left here, right? Existence is already given thereby, but the mode in which I am to determine this existence, that is the manifold belonging to it is not thereby given. Right, so this activity of um, argument, doubt, persuasion, discursive intellection, determining um, uh, the fact that I'm doing this is enough to show that I exist. But uh, just in that by itself, um, nothing is said about the um the way i'm referring to myself <laughs> um and you know and how is that possible well i mean i think so kant's answer well maybe i should say i don't know which to say first descartes answer is that that's not possible Right, that I couldn't have proved that I exist without showing what I am. And therefore, um, what I am must be contained somehow in that proof. Right, so this is um, what Descartes goes on to say. This is, I should have made, maybe made it more clear when I was showing Descartes, when I was showing Kant. This is back to Descartes. This is still the second meditation. But what then, am I, what then am I? A thing that thinks. What is that? A thing that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, is willing, is unwilling, and also imagines and has sensory perceptions. Where does that list come from? This is the considerable list if everything on it belongs to me. But does it? Answer, is it not one and the same I who is now doubting almost everything, who nonetheless understands some things, who affirms that this one thing is true, denies everything else, desires to know more, etc.? cetera, right? It's all the things that, that I had to do to carry out this argument and be in the position I am now of asking what I am. Those are the things that I've shown to exist. Something that does all of that. <laughs> so this is an example of what we'll see Kant says later on in the paralogisms that rational psychology is a science based on a single text, I think. Right? Like somehow it's trying to find out everything about uh, an object of representation just from the fact that I think. And Kant is going to say, I mean, he already says here for the first time that that's not going to work. So what's the answer according to Kant? According to Kant, the answer is, how how is it that I could have shown that I exist without showing what exists? Because the whole thing was an abstraction. <laughs> Right, like I didn't really only show that I exist. I had to at the same time show something about what exists, but when I think only about the intellectual part of it, um, about the active part of it, then I'm only left with half the conclusion, basically. Right, so I know this. Is, so, so like that part of it is that something exists, but you have to add back in the other part, right? So, um, um. No, I wrote. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry.
in the synthetic original unity of app perception, I am conscious of myself, not as I appear to myself, nor as I am in myself, right? So that is neither as phenomenon nor as noumenon, but only that I am. How can that be? This representation is a thought, not an intuition. Now, in order to know ourselves, there is required in addition to the act of thought, which brings the manifold of every possible intuition to the unity of apperception, a determinate mode of intuition whereby this manifold is given. Did I? A determinate mode of intuition whereby this manifold is given. That is... So according to Kant, the, the I think or ego cogito is a kind of general concept. It's a principle to which the object given an inner sense may conform. And according to the previous argument of the first part of the transcendental deduction, not only may it conform, but it must, it must conform. So it, I mean, it's it's like any general concept according to Kant, right? Remember, his general his his uh, overall view is that concepts without intuitions are empty; they have no way of referring to any object. Here's the concept. Um, the concept is a general rule to which something could conform, but it doesn't give any particular thing. So the particular thing has to come from sensible intuition. And sensible intuition is a faculty of being affected by the object. I know that what I just wrote there is illegible, but this is concept. And this is sensible intuition. All right. So, I mean, so similarly, what we have here is the, the I think. And sometimes Kant says that you can you could consider I think to be either a judgment or a concept, depending on how you look at it. Um, right. The, I mean, the reason you can think of it as a concept is, again, that it's it, all it says is that some single rule unifies the manifold given an inner sense. So that single rule is a concept. So the I think is a is a concept or is a um, later in the paralogisms he's going to call it a vehicle of concepts. <laughs> right? It's it's uh um it's actually, I mean, this is where in the first part of the deduction, he refers back to those convertible transcendentals of section 12 and says that the unity of apperception is not the category of unity, but is something higher and, and qualitative, right? And then he refers back to those convertible transcendentals where, where so that the I think is the, um, is, the subjective unity of concepts. Um, and so uh, it's um, without saying what the concept is, but we know that we do know something about what the concept is because we know the concept involves the categories. The, so, um, but the I think itself just says there's some concept, there's some empirical concept that is objectively valid, that has an object, and its object, um, what is its object? So again, Kant says, um, that if it were if all we had were this i think that we we wouldn't be thinking about an object in order to know ourselves there is required in addition to the act of thought 
which brings the manifold of every possible intuition to the unity of apperception, a determinate mode of intuition whereby this manifold is given. Right? So the answer to what am I? That is the answer to what is the object that's thought in this concept, I think, um, can't be found by looking inside this concept, I think. Just as in general, you can't find the, uh, the object of a general representation in the representation. You have to wait for the object to um, show itself, so to speak. And, but the way I show myself is to this con to this conception in general is by the mode in which I can affect myself in general, that is the form of inner sense. So it's these two put together that, can, that, that constitute a general representation of myself. Um, Right, he says the same thing again on the next page on B158, it's page 169 in Kemp Smith. Just as for the knowledge of an object distinct from me, I require besides the thought of an object in general in the category, an intuition by which I determine that general concept. So actually here, I think I understand what determine means. Here, determine means like aim, give, right? Give a terminus in the sense of a, um, a goal or aim to the concept. An intuition by which I determine that general concept. So for knowledge of myself, I require besides the consciousness, that is besides the thought of myself, an intuition of the manifold in me by which I determine this thought. So that's the answer, that's Kant's answer to what Descartes is missing. Descartes is missing that the um, that what the I think shows to exist is you can't tell it just from the I think. You can't tell just from the cogito argument what you've shown exists. You have to bring in the form of inner sense. Um, now, I think, um, so I believe I said this before, but I'll, I'll say it again now that we've read it, that the, like, at first, except for the fact that he starts mentioning space and time a lot now, it can be hard to see where Kant has brought in the properties of space and time in the second part of the deduction. But the place he's brought them in is by discussing the faculty of imagination. So imagination, remember from before that we know that imagination is the faculty of synthesis, right? Um, I mean, again, sometimes he uses synthesis in a looser way and he'll say the understanding has a synthesis and the imagination has a synthesis. But I think when he's being strict, he says the imagination performs synthesis that is putting together, whereas the understanding supplies unity of synthesis. That is, shows, you know, represents what's thus been put together as conforming to a rule. Um, so, uh, in, so we know that imagination is what does that. But I think um, more than that, that imagination is um, is the name for the way we do that. 
that is it's the name for the way beings with our form of sensible intuition do that so if you look on this is the definition of imagination um B151 on page 165 in Kemp Smith. Um, Imagination is the faculty of representing an intuition, an object that is not itself present. So you can see I crossed this out here and I wrote the German up here. What it, what it says is, um, even without its presence, Imagination is the faculty of representing an object and in intuition, even without its presence. And the word that's used for presence here is, um, right, so representing an object even without presence. And the word that's used for presence here is Gegenwart. So Gegenwart is, I mean, it's perfectly good. Oh, sorry. I've been writing on the board and you can't see it. Oops. Right. Imagination. Represent an object even without its presence is what that says. And then under presence, I wrote Gegenwart. So Gegenwart, I mean, it's fine to translate it as presence, but you should know that it's it it's the word for present as a as opposed to past and future in German. Um, so its presence here means like it's being in the present. <laughs> Um, so that is imagination is an, I think is an intrinsically temporal faculty. It's a faculty for um, representing things that were now. This again, if you're in 100C, this is the same like uh, in this week's reading or next week's reading, I guess it's next. I mean, the reading for next time, where Locke is going to talk about um, um, the way memory allows me to know that certain things were, <laughs> just as senses allow me to know that certain things are. Um, so, uh, like, memory is... Um, is an example, I mean, I think this is true already in Aristotle, that memory is is a function of the imagination. Um, and moreover, it's the basic function of the imagination, really. Right? I mean, that, like, um, empirical concepts, remember, are gathered from things that I, that I really have experienced. And so, like when I imagine things, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm basically remembering at least the pieces of which my imagination are made are all memories, right? So that maybe I never saw a unicorn before, but I've seen a horse and I've seen a horn, <laughs> um, right? So, um. So, so the the way the form of inner sense comes in in this part of the deduction is through the faculty of imagination. The faculty of imagination is essentially a faculty um, of for synthesis of a of 
something temporally manifold. <laughs> and if you go back to Descartes, I'm going to one more time back to Descartes. So first of all, this is from the sixth meditation. Um, remember like imagination and sense were at the end of the list of the things that I can do in the second meditation so here in the sixth meditation he says besides this I consider that this power of imagining which is in me Differing as it does from the power of understanding or intellection is not a necessary constituent of my own existence, that is, of the essence of my mind. So Descartes doesn't explain exactly how we know that, um, but He's, um, I think, the way Kant would understand what's going on in that passage is that Descartes is acknowledging that when he considers himself as a um, um, as an intellectual being, this is a little tricky because Descartes actually uses think to include sensation as well, right? So there may even be like a miscommunication between Descartes and Kant here, I'm not sure. But anyway, when Descartes considers himself as a thinking thing, as at least as Kant understands thinking thing, that means abstracting from the, fa from the fact that he also has an imagination. And so even though he like imagination, he's including imagination and in what he's what he's shown to exist, it has this kind of weird status because it like it really is kind of extra. <laughs> so um um so if we go back to the cogito argument itself, so that is so I guess I could say, so therefore, how did imagination get in if it's extra, if it's not part of the essence of my mind? Where did it come from? Well, look back at this. If I convinced myself of something, then I certainly existed. It's in the past tense. Right, the cogito argument, when it first occurs, strictly speaking, shows that I existed. So time and therefore imagination have snuck in. <laughs> I think is the way Kant would understand what happened here. Um, and you know, but Descartes realizing that they've come in and therefore including them what is proved um, doesn't realize that they offer a completely different answer to this question. What is this I that I've now shown to exist? Um, an, an empirical answer, basically, or at least a sensible rather than intellectual answer. Um, I guess, yeah, I shouldn't call it empirical because it's it's the pure form of inner sense that I use. Right? I mean, as, as Kant says a couple of times in the transcendental deduction, the, the transcendental unity of apperception is not the same as the empirical unity of apperception. So the empirical unity of apperception means like actually developing the concept that applies to the actual manifold of myself as given in inner sense. And Kant says, sometimes I can do that and sometimes I can't. Um, that depends on all kinds of conditions besides the uh, transcendental a priori conditions. 
Um, so like if I'm really confused and my, you know, and my memory is not good, then I'm, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that very much. Um, um, but what I know a priori is that some way of doing that is possible. <laughs> whether I'm actually able to carry that out or not. Because again, like um, in thinking in thinking anything, I'm representing myself as um, being somehow given as an object. And since I can't deny that I'm thinking, I can't deny that I'm that I'm somehow given as an object. So I can start looking for the empirical concept. But what I have is the a priori skeleton of the concept, basically. Right? Like what I have is I know the categories apply to myself, and I know they apply to myself as a man as a temporal manifold, as something temporally manifold. I see Terry asked a long time ago, so is determining judging? Determining can mean a lot of things, but it, it doesn't mean the same thing as judging, although judging involves determining. Um, okay, so I, like I said, I'm, maybe if I have time... Um, I guess, I mean, I'll just say determining. So first of all, to, to make sense of what I'm about to say, you have to accept my one of my general principles of Kant interpretation, which is that even after Kant starts writing in German, right? So I think I mentioned this in my, in my initial uh, like introductory lecture. Kant early on wrote at least his serious systematic part works in Latin. That's, that is his, his in the pre-critical period, before the silent decade, <laughs> he wrote his most important systematic works in Latin. After the silent decade, when he comes out with a critique of pure reason, it's in German, it's not in Latin. But I think he still thinks in Latin. <laughs> So you can see that right, every once in a while he'll break into the German text with a Latin phrase in parentheses, right? Because he's like trying to, to tell you what the Latin equivalent of what he just said is. <laughs> um, so, um, so the reason I, I emphasize that here is because like... Um, so the German word for determining is bestimmen, right? This is the verb to determine. And this, this stimmen here, like, it comes from the word for voice. <laughs> it's actually a cognate of the Greek word uh, stoma, which means mouth. <laughs> but uh um and stimme among other things can mean voice in german but bestimmen means in bestimmen it, it apparently means something like you know it, it comes it must come from the use of stimmen to mean like to vote <laughs> um I, i'm Anyway, uh, like it's it doesn't contain any parts that are related to the English word determine, but it's being used as the equivalent of the of the Latin word. Determinare, right, which is where we get the English word determine and you know this has. terminus in it. So, and the, the day here, I think, is kind of causal. 
Um, so like de terminare means like to kind of make something a terminus or to make something have a terminus, to give it a terminus, something like that. I think it can mean all of those things, unfortunately. That's part of the problem. And terminus itself can mean two different things, right? Like this can mean limit or border. But it could also mean like aim, target. So, um, so one thing determined means is to set a border to something. Or I guess if you were talking in time, you could say, you know, setting setting off a certain span of time by its termini, by its ends, its limits. Um, um, so that's one thing determined can mean, but another thing determined can mean is to aim, and then it can mean either like to give something an aim or to make something your aim. <laughs> Um, and bec it's because of all those ambiguities that, like, there's an important phrase that keeps happening in the second part of the transcendental deduction. Um, the understanding determines the inner sense. It's it's clearly really important, and it seems to be related to something he's going to say in the schematism, which is the reading for next time about determinations of the inner sense. <laughs> um, but I'm really, I really feel like despite having once again this year squinted at it for a long time, I'm not sure exactly what it means. <laughs> um, all right, anyway. Um, Okay, but let me, uh, I was going to say that at the end, but I said it now instead because of Perry's question. Right, so judgment definitely involves some kind of, involves both of these kinds of determination. That's, an, that's another problem about this. I mean, I almost feel like, like Kant actually doesn't think that these are just two different meanings of the term. That he that that somehow these are two versions of the same thing, these two kinds of determination. And uh but there again I don't I'm not sure I understand. Like so one thing, but you know so the understanding determines the inner sense, like it could mean, and sometimes I think this is what it means, the understanding takes the takes inner sense as its aim or object. Um, but then other times it seems like Determining inner sense means making it be one way rather than another, something like that. Like making it obey the rules of the categories. So that would be more the the, the limiting sense, right? Like, yeah. So um, so I'm afraid there's something I don't understand here. But um, anyway, let me go back to talking about things I do understand <laughs> or think I understand. I mean, if there's some if if there's something so important that I don't understand, that means like you know, the other part might be wrong too. But I'm doing my best. So um, anyway, this book is hard. Um, so I want to go back to talking about the imagination here, um, like exactly what Kant thinks this faculty of imagination is. So, I mean, first of all, I guess oh, I shouldn't have erased that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
right? That imagination is the faculty of representing an object in intuition. Even without its presence. Now, I mean, this actually um, is, from some point of view, a perfectly standard definition of the faculty of imagination, right? That is so. Uh, um, if you know what Aristotle says about imagination, or if you remember uh, what the rationalists in 100b said about imagination, or if you uh, know what the empiricists in 100c say about imagination, they all think of it along these lines that imagination, that is, they all mean by the term imagination or the Greek word fantasia, right? That um it's um it's just like seeing or otherwise sensing but as you can tell even from the term imagination in latin usually you're thinking about seeing right um so it's just like seeing it's let's say kind of like subjectively the same as seeing or similar to it anyway but the object isn't there. <laughs> That's what imagination is. Um, so like this definition, representing an object in intuition, even without its presence, is a, like um, is a traditional use of the term imagination. However, um, and I guess I should say, it's also traditional, at least for Aristotelians. So here already, maybe this is part of Kant's, like I mentioned to begin with, that Kant is trying to go back to the a pre-modern view about how sense and intellection have to work together to, to, to have knowledge. Um, so at least for Aristotelians, um, it's clear that uh, this capability, which might sound kind of um, frivolous, right? Like the ability to kind of sit around imagining castles in the air or something like that, that somehow this capability is fundamental to our, to our ability to uh, um, represent things intellectually, right? So like Aristotle says that, you know, um, there can be no noose, there can be no intellect without imagination. <laughs> um, so like without trying to understand what Aristotle actually thinks about that, I'm trying to explain what Kant thinks about it, like why Kant thinks that this faculty is, uh, like how Kant thinks that this faculty is, is crucial for the connection, so to speak, between sensibility and uh, understanding or intellect. Um, so, because, and I think the first thing to realize is that Kant doesn't think of the imagination um, as the faculty, and I mean, could you even call this a faculty of like calling up random images, like in a hallucination? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, maybe when that happens, you can say it's an effect of the imagination, but that's not what the imagination is for. The imagination is for um, calling up images that are in some sense appropriate, right? So it's representing an object, so to speak, as needed. <laughs> in intuition, even without its presence.
And so in the empirical use of this faculty, which again, I think as in the case of intuition and the case of understanding, the empirical use is the actual use. <laughs> Right. The a priori use is uh, like an explanation of what capabilities we must have to make the empirical use possible or something like that. So the um, the empirical use of the understanding, um, it's I mean, it's 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 for that reason that the law of association according to Kant is like a fundamental is the fundamental law of the empirical use of the imagination. Um, and, you know, the way it works is uh, like if I've experienced cinnabar lots of times before, and it was always heavy, red, toxic, et cetera, right? And now I experience something that's heavy and red and has a lot of the other, those characteristics that always go to go together or always have gone together in the past. The imagination supplies images of the remaining ones. Um, and, um, uh, if it just did, if, if all I had was an imagination, then, um, I would have associations. Remember, Kant contrasted the putting together representations just due to my association versus, versus putting them together in the object. If I only had an imagination, I it 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 would it would put things together in such a way that I could compare them to a concept, but I wouldn't actually have the concept. And so this is what the what Aristotle says non-human animals do, right? That the imagination, like they imagine, or at least the higher non-human animals, the ones that have memory and therefore imagination, um, that their imagination supplies the place of reason for them. That's what Aristotle says. Um, I I mean. I think Kant probably thinks the same thing. I'm not sure if he's if, if he says this anywhere, but um, that you know a non-human animal, its imagination would supply the kind of associations that could be unified by a rule, and that allows it, in a certain sense, to act rationally, right? So that is to kind of expect this thing that's red and heavy will also be toxic but without actually representing there there being a principle in the object that makes that necessary so but in us the imagination does this for the purpose of the understanding it so this as needed at, at least and again, in the use of imagination in representing the beautiful and whatever, it's different. But in the theoretical, empirical use of the imagination, this this as needed means as needed by the understanding. Right, so I'm trying to compare this thing to my rule, and it like it's never going to have all the characteristics. That's we'll see him talking about that in the schematism, the next section when he talks about how we apply empirical concepts. 
the the image that I get is never going to have all the characteristics that the rule demands. Right, I only see part of it. I, you know, whatever. But but it's the it's the empirical imagination is able to supply the other ones by association, and then I can see. Oh, okay. So as far as this goes, it corresponds to the rule. Terry, I'll ask something again. So is this process of association a potential route from a Kantian perspective to new concepts? Yeah, I mean, so the imagination, so when we form a new empirical concept, the, the association happens first. And in, in, in that way, Kant agrees with empiricists about how we form concepts. Um, but he says that, you know, um, uh, we wouldn't be able to form any concept if we didn't have the capabilities that are that are like dissected out as the categories. <laughs> and we can't acquire those from by association. Right. So like that's what those non-human animals don't have, so to speak. Right. So they, therefore, no matter how much association they get, they don't have the capability of representing it as corresponding to a unified rule. Um, okay, so all of that is about the empirical imagination. Um, and right, so so now we know that. Um, um, since I must be given to myself as an object in the temporally manifold given, <laughs> um, that means the imagination has to be, the empirical imagination must be able to synthesize that manifold for the purpose of being united into, under the concept of myself. And um, again, like taking the a priori uh, act of a faculty to mean like the um, the capability of the empirical act or something like that. Um, I think that's what Kant calls the transcendental synthesis of imagination. Right, that is just as the understanding has transcendental a priori concepts of an object in general, namely the categories, which are really just the, the capabilities that are involved in forming empirical concepts, right? And the, the um, sensible intuition has like trans, well, they're not, well, has a priori intuitions of space and time, which are really just like the parts of a capability of receiving sensations, that is empirical intuitions. The imagination has a transcendental synthesis, which is really just like the necessary capability of performing an empirical synthesis. Um, So, and this is the way, and I mean, I think it's especially hard to uh, to unravel all the all the metaphorical way of talking here and make sense of it. And I'm not sure I can, but. Um, The understanding, that is to say, wait, is that what I wanted to start reading? No. 
what determines inner sense, so there's that phrase, which I'm not sure what it means. What determines inner sense is the understanding and its original power of combining the manifold of intuition. That is, of bringing it under an apperception. And then skipping down a little bit. It's synthesis, therefore, that is the synthesis of the understanding. And this is a place where, again, I think synthesis is being used a little bit loosely. It's what this really is, is unity of synthesis, not synthesis, I think. It's synthesis, therefore, if the synthesis be viewed by itself alone, is nothing but the unity of the act, of which, as an act, it is conscious to itself, even without sensibility but through which it, it is yet able to determine the sensibility. So the this act is the I think, right? The unity of the act, it's conscious of, to it, it's conscious to itself of the unity of the act, even without sensibility, that means in abstraction from sensibility, not floating in some space where there's no sensibility, because that never happened, right? Remember, all our knowledge begins with experience. There is no a priori time where we don't have any experience. So, so there is no time when I'm conscious of the unity of this act of unifying the manifold in intuition. I don't actually have a manifold of intu in, in intuition being unified. It's always there, but the consciousness of the act is not the consciousness of the manifold, right? That is, I can abstract one from the other. That's the same thing we were talking about before with saying that like the I think by itself is merely a thought and it requires an intuition. Before, But before we said intuition is needed to determine the understanding, and I said, I understood that, but now we're talking about the understanding, determining the sensibility and that I'm not sure I understand. All right. But in any case, right? So the, the point is there's this um, unity of synthesis, which is the synthetic unity of apperception that belongs to the understanding itself in abstraction from anything about our sensible faculties. Um, but then it says, thus the understanding under the title of a transcendental synthesis of imagination performs this act upon the passive subject whose faculty it is. And we are therefore justified in saying that inner sense is affected thereby. So that, um, okay, so it's something like this. I mean, Oh, I'm out of time, so I I won't I won't get to say what it's something like. <laughs> um, uh, but I guess I'll just say I mean this is to boil it down to kind of one sentence. What I understand is going on here: the activity that Kant calls determining here is mine that is the principle is my concept it's my rule but the subject of the activity the thing that's doing the determining or thinking is known only by the effect quote unquote of that principle on the imagination uh, which is the effect of that principle is the imagination's 
production of the manifold in conformity to it. So, um, um, it's an effect, of course, not in the sense that I, I somehow like push the imagination and make it do it. It's, it's, it's more that I'm the final cause, <laughs> right? The, like, the imagination is doing this for my principle and it's, um, and it's in experiencing that the imagination supplying the appropriate synthesis that I'm aware of whatever it is that's doing the determining. Um, okay, I'm not sure if that made any sense or not, but <laughs> that's all I have time for. And so I will see. Okay, so again, there's no class on Monday. There will be a class on Wednesday, which I hope will be in person. And then there'll be one more Thursday lecture after that. And then we'll be back to the regular schedule. Okay, so hopefully I will see everyone on Wednesday. Bye. Thanks, Abe. Thank you. Thank you.